Tonight, a scientific discovery that's totally out of this world. We have seen what we thought was unseeable. For the first time, scientists have captured an image of a black hole. This marks the beginning of a new era in astronomy. What that single shot means for science here on Earth. Please do not waste this time. Another twist in the Brexit drama. The EU agrees to an extension until October 31st. Is it a trick or treat for the UK? And billions for transit. We are building subways, my friends. The ambitious plan to ease congestion in Canada's largest city. But will it ever happen? This is The National. Even for physicists, black holes challenge the imagination. Einstein's own equations predicted them, but he doubted they existed. And a black hole has never actually been seen, not directly until now. Now we have an image of space and time bent towards infinity, a hole that swallows everything, even light. And in that darkness, scientists see a new dawn for our understanding of the universe. Kasarusi explains the picture and the waves it's making. For one of the deepest mysteries in the universe. To share in this extraordinary moment. The reveal was a global event with simultaneous news conferences around the world. Here it is. The first ever image of a black hole. We are delighted to be able to report to you today that we have seen what we thought was unseeable. Scientists describe it as a monster. At a supermassive black hole that's almost the size of our entire solar system. This black hole was found in a galaxy called M87, 55 million light years away from Earth. The image a bit fuzzy, but it does show the inner edge of the black hole, the so-called event horizon, the space where the gravitational pull is so strong that even light can't escape. Surrounding this is a bright orange ring of fire caused by superheated gases and dust. To see something for the first time, you know, to know that you've uncovered part of the universe that was off limits to us. When that happens, it's an extraordinary feeling. To capture this first ever image, not one, but a network of eight giant telescopes were scattered around the globe, creating an Earth-sized telescope and collecting millions of gigabytes of data. This marks the beginning of a new era in astronomy, a new era of, of research into gravity. Um, and we really just are standing at the threshold today. At nearly light speed. The image confirms what scientists had believed what a black hole would look like. But it also shows that Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity was right all those years ago. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. So there's no one better to talk to on a day like this than Bob McDonald. So, Bob, for sure, this feels like a marvel. But why is directly seeing a black hole so important for science? Well, Adrian, it shows us that they're really out there. We've finally seen one. I mean, they've been theorizing about these things for so many years and predicting what they would be like, but until you see one in nature, you don't know if you're right. So, yeah, the scientists are right. That's why they're all jumping up and down, and they're so happy about it. But when I look at that picture and I see that fuzzy donut, the dark space in the middle, I see the limits of our knowledge because we don't know what goes on in there because once you pass that event horizon, all of the laws of physics that we know in our universe just break down. So it's kind of exciting that now we can see black holes in action and try to figure out one of the most fundamental forces in nature, gravity. That's holding you in your chair right now. It reaches out to the edge of the universe, but we can't control it. And maybe by understanding it a little better, someday we, who knows, we might even be able to turn it off. <laughs> so if we know it's real and we've seen it, what do you, what do, you do with that information? Well, this is fundamental science. It's basic science, just trying to understand how the universe works. But if you think about what we learned when we found other forces, look what happened when we found magnetism. We could make compasses and sail over the horizon. When we discovered electricity, my God, look what happened with that stuff. So gravity is another one of these forces that's out there. We can't control it, but if we could, or if we can integrate it with all the other forces in the universe, then who knows what that's going to bring. It's going to be future generations, grandchildren from now, 
now who will benefit from it. But right now, we just want to understand how it works, and today was a big milestone by actually be able to, being able to see it work in action for real. There are no limits to your enthusiasm. Bob McDonald, <laughs> thanks very much. Okay, Adrian. Okay, so what lies inside the black hole? And if you could get to the edge of one and dip in, not that you could, but still, what would happen then? The answer is actually a matter of heated debate. Once you pierce the event horizon, there is really no turning back. One theory is you're enveloped in darkness and at first might not feel anything at all, but soon enough, intense gravitational forces pull you, stretching you like a noodle, a process actually called spaghettification, ripping you to pieces, and then you're squished into an infinitely small point, or it might get even worse. Some physicists now theorize that just beyond the event horizon, there's a layer of energized particles, basically a wall of fire that would incinerate you long before you turn into spaghetti. So short answer, just don't go into a black hole. Okay, so forgive me here, Rosie, but while we're talking of event horizons and what feels like points of no return, the UK is heading towards Brexit with no deal, <laughs> and yet there might just be a reprieve. Yeah, hopefully not a black hole, though, Adrian. <laughs> Britain's Prime Minister had a big ask for the European Union today, was to delay the UK's Brexit again. The EU's answer tonight has a spooky ring to it, October 31st, a deadline that buys Theresa May some desperately needed time. But as Thomas Degla tells us, it doesn't really solve May's considerable problems at home. She's been here before. The British Prime Minister in Brussels to ask for a little more time and patience in a place that's running low on both. I know many people will be frustrated that the summit is taking place at all uh, because the UK should have left the EU by now. Leaders from across Europe again put everything on hold to come deal with Britain's messy EU divorce. The main power brokers apparently split over whether to give in to Britain's demand or make the Brexiters sweat a little. German Chancellor Angela Merkel asking to discuss the British Prime Minister's request with an open mind. Lurking in the background, the threat of a no-deal Brexit on Friday and the French president adopting a hard-line stance. Nothing should be taken for granted, said Emmanuel Macron, certainly not a long extension. There's an air of exasperation here. Just ask the European Parliament's longest serving member, Elmar Brock. Uh, our people are fed up and someone wants to go out of an entity, he should know before how. London should talk to London and then come back to us. Sounds tiring. It's tiring. EU leaders spent hours in this room debating the length of the Brexit delay, agreeing only well after midnight on a new deadline of October 31st. I do not pretend that the next few weeks will be easy or there is a simple way to break the deadlock in Parliament. The new target date, six months away, will remove pressure on MPs in London to accept May's unpopular Brexit deal. The pressure on her, though, will only ramp up. The Prime Minister had already pledged to resign soon, and now after failing to deliver Brexit on time twice, she could be forced out the door even sooner than planned. Thomas Dagg with CBC News, Brussels. So what could happen in six months? Maybe a lot, perhaps a deal, perhaps a leadership review, perhaps a new vote, or perhaps we all might need to learn a new Brexit word, Brextension, extension, Brextension, <laughs> some are muttering tonight, because the EU has not entirely ruled out now the possibility that October 31st might not be a final deadline. Okay, now to a CBC News investigation. When our Go Public team first brought you stories about aggressive sales tax at the big banks, the banking regulator looked into it and issued a report. But now there are questions about how independent that report really was. As Erica Johnson tells us, internal government documents showed the banks themselves weighed in, and so did the Federal Finance Department. <laughs> A flood of allegations. The pressure was on for the government to do something after reports of aggressive sales practices at Canada's big banks. The calls for action are growing. Bank employees were telling GoPublic they lied about mortgage rates, credit card fees, investment products to try to hit sales targets. 
You feel pretty awful knowing that you could have caused some serious harm to them, all in the name of profit, for a bank. The banking regulator, the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada, issued its report last year, saying there was a sharp focus on sales, but it did not find widespread mis-selling. Now, internal government documents reveal that regulator sent a draft copy of its report to the banks themselves, weeks before releasing a final report. They have uh, disproportionate access and perhaps disproportionate influence, and it's too much behind the scenes and not enough out in the open. The regulator says it gave the banks the report so they could identify factual errors. The documents also reveal the regulator sent the finance minister a draft copy. It's hard to say what happened, but the next version of the report was weakened. Recommendations that said require the banks to do this and that uh, really effective requirements were changed into suggestions. A line that would require banks to work in the best interests of their customers disappeared. Another line was added, saying the regulator did not find widespread mis-selling during its review. The line that the agency didn't find a widespread problem is actually contradicted by what's in the rest of the report. The minister's office told Go Public it did not provide comments or request any edits to the FCAC's report. However, notes in the margin of a draft copy show the finance minister's department weighed in at least six times. The finance ministry said it was routine to share documents and confirm facts. And Erica joins us now. All right, any comment from the finance minister or the banks, Erica? Well, we asked for an interview with the Minister of Finance, Bill Morneau, but we were told that he was unavailable. We also asked the banks about what appeared to be their response to the draft report from the regulator. Pages and pages completely blacked out. We have no idea what's in them, and the Association for the Banks uh, wouldn't elaborate. Okay, so despite all of this, though, there are some new consumer protections coming at some point. There are. The Department of Finance said after the bank review, it decided to add some more consumer protections in the Bank Act, which was recently passed. And amongst those protections are new rules that will prohibit banks from engaging in high-pressure sales tactics. And the department says it's now working on implementing those new protections. Okay. Erica Johnson, thank you. Thank you. From frustration over sales tactics at the banks to something else that has so many complaining, a crowded commute. Here in the greater, greater Toronto area today, Ontario's government laid out a $28 billion plan to fix transit in Canada's biggest city. So on the worst days, this is the transit reality in Toronto. Subway platforms dangerously busy, passengers packed in like cattle. The debate over what to do about it has been going on for years and today, as part of that new transit expansion plan, something Premier Doug Ford says is a game changer. A new Ontario line stretching from east to west running right through the downtown. Now the price tag on that one line is nearly $11 billion, which is about how much the province is committing to the entire project. But money isn't all that's required. Nicole Ireland looks at the need and the politics at play. The people of Ontario have waited long enough. You have waited long enough. The wait has been decades, and transit users feel it. If we weren't building more transit, uh, it would just be more congestion. So that reaches a critical mass at some point, and that's just asking for failure. I think it's a great idea. Um, whether it'll come to fruition or not will be uh, another thing altogether. Toronto's population has been booming, and engineers have long warned that public transit isn't keeping up. We haven't invested the way we needed for the last 30 years of growth. We're facing another 30 years of growth on top of that. It gets actually kind of scary and daunting uh, to say, can we catch up? Here's Ford's $28 billion plan. Relieve congestion with an additional line and extend three others. But only $11 billion of the total will come from the province. Ford assumes the rest would be paid for by the City of Toronto, the federal government and private partnerships. The problem is, the federal government wasn't even consulted on this plan. Finance Minister Bill Morneau isn't impressed. We have already put significant funding and we have uh, found it difficult to actually get these projects going because the Ontario government is not at the table trying to get those projects happening. And frankly, jobs are on the line. Scarborough doesn't end at McCowan. Toronto um, Transit advocate Sheila Pizzi-Allen worries that not only will Ford's promises not be fulfilled, 
they'll set back progress the city of Toronto was already making. This is basically ripping up our city's transit plans and sending us back to square one. The first of the big ticket items, a long-awaited downtown relief line, wouldn't be completed until at least 2027, and that's assuming all the political players can get along. Nicole Ireland, CBC News, Toronto. Right now, the subway line that goes into the heart of downtown Toronto runs at or above capacity every weekday, according to the TTC. The result of so few lines serving so many people. After New York City and Mexico City, Toronto has the third busiest transit system in North America. A big part of it is streetcar service. But clear that away and you see just how small the subway coverage really is. Toronto's three subway lines stretch for just over 70 kilometers. I compare that to Mexico City where 12 lines run for more than 200 kilometers. And New York City where 22 subway routes cover more than 1,000 kilometers. Enough to take you to Chicago if the tracks were laid end to end. After today's cash commitment from Ontario, you can expect more. Tomorrow, the Ford government is putting out its first budget. We will be crunching those details tomorrow night. Here are some of the other stories we are following. A woman has died after she was stabbed in Toronto's underground path system tonight. It happened just before 8 o'clock in the King and Bay area of downtown. The victim is believed to be between 20 and 30 years old. Police say a male suspect fled on foot. I, I think there was a spying did occur. Well, let me... But uh, the question is whether it was predicated, adequately predicated, and I'm not suggesting it wasn't adequate. U.S. Attorney General William Barr sparked controversy today, saying he believes intelligence agencies spied on the 2016 Trump campaign. He was speaking in front of a congressional hearing that was dominated by questions about the Russia investigation, and Democrats are now furious and demanded Barr retract his comments unless he has specific evidence to back them up. More than 4 million people are under blizzard warnings tonight, but don't worry, it's in the U.S. Midwest. They are bracing for potentially record-breaking spring storm. Heavy snowfall, high winds and whiteouts are expected to last until tomorrow. And more than 700 flights have already been cancelled. Might be a problem there. Meanwhile, Quebecers are still recovering from their own storm. Two days after the province was walloped with freezing rain, crews are making progress. Now just tens of thousands are without power. At the blackout's peak, 316,000 customers were in the dark. Still ahead on The National, the day after the election, how do Israelis feel about their choice? Plus, just days before Albertans head to the polls, new documents raise questions about how the United Conservatives chose its leader. And later, fighting hate with friendship, the unlikely bond that has these two men pushing for change. We talked a lot about our dads, and we talked a lot about our daughters. And we found out as we're sharing stories of our loved ones, like how similar not only our loved ones were, but how similar we were. And you know, folks, Alberta elections, they have a way of surprising people. And I think this one might just do that as well. If you want a government that will, without apology, stand up to Justin Trudeau and the foreign-funded special interests and really fight like never before for the industry that has created so much opportunity for us, then please, work hard in the next six days. And just six days from now, Alberta voters will choose their next government. Tonight, CBC News reveals documents that raise questions about how the front-running party chose its leader back in 2017. Members of the United Conservative Party needed personal identification numbers, PINs, to cast their votes online. We found that fraudulent email addresses, which included the names of real party members, were used to send out some of those PINs. The real members never received them, but those were votes. Those votes were cast. The RCMP is now investigating, and Carolyn Dunn takes us through this CBC News investigation. In a bustling coffee shop, a man will call Raj met CBC News on two conditions. We don't photograph him and we disguise his recorded voice. He's concerned about ramifications of speaking publicly within his tight Indo-Canadian community. It's not every day a journalist tells you that someone cast a vote in your name. Clearly I can say 100% we did not vote. They kind of used us. 
CBC News analyzed 49 United Conservative Party memberships, including those of Raj and his family, because those memberships were linked to suspicious-looking email domains. Using leaked lists of UCP memberships, voter registrations, and voter confirmations, we were able to piece together a disconcerting picture. All of the email domains had been purchased anonymously from a company called Bluehost. All were purchased within five weeks of the UCP leadership vote. None of the dozens of UCP members we managed to reach had ever heard of the bogus email addresses. None knew that a PIN, which allows a member to vote online, had been issued to the fake email bearing their name. None knew a vote had been cast in their name. Of the 31 votes cast using fake email addresses, we managed to reach 12 members whose names are in those addresses. They all confirmed they had never cast a vote. We can't say for certain who bought the emails or who cast the votes. We also can't determine how widespread or isolated the vote rigging really was. After all, there were tens of thousands of members registered to vote. But the suspicious emails are part of the RCMP's inquiry into the UCP leadership contest. CBC News has confirmed the Mounties have interviewed numerous people in connection to the vote rigging, including Raj and his father. My dad was flustered, scared. They said, was there a pin email to you? And I said, no, since we make sense that we didn't get a pin because the emails they showed us were not real or they were real, I guess, but none of ours. In Televote, the company whose online voting system was used for the leadership vote says everything on its end was fine. If somebody has a valid pin in their hand and it's used to cast a ballot, the system is performing exactly the way it's supposed to. The question is, is did somebody do something illegal or nefarious to get their hands on uh, pins that they shouldn't have had their hands on? UCP leader Jason Kenney addressed the issue this way. If there's anybody who didn't vote... Um, uh, you know, authentically, then that's, that, that concerns me, obviously. But uh, I, um, as a candidate, uh, in, ensured that our team uh, complied with the rules. That's what our campaign management did. And I uh, believe in the credibility of our whole process. And his party says it's confident in Kenny's decisive victory to lead it. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. As the election approaches, the National will have special coverage of just what's at stake for the province and, yes, the entire country. There is anger over the plight of the oil industry, a plodding economy that shed thousands of jobs, and that question of how to deal with the federal government here in Ottawa. I'll be in Battleground Calgary starting on Sunday as Albertans prepare to decide their future, and we will, of course, have results right here on the National on Tuesday. Still ahead on the national, racist violence brought them together. How two men were able to build an uncommon friendship. And later, it's the viral photo that's come to symbolize the current protests in Sudan. We hear from the woman behind the lens. I'm proud to be uh, from the people who try to make Sudan history. Okay, by capture this photo. Mr. Speaker, we are ultimately here because 15, 50 people died and they do not have a voice. Today, the New Zealand Parliament voted to tighten up the country's gun laws weeks after a declared white supremacist opened fire in two mosques. And in Canada today, a warning from the head of the spy service. We are more and more preoccupied by the uh, number of, um, of uh, ultra right-wing extremists, white nationalism, uh, ethno-nationalism, uh, white supremacist. The threat is clear, but can we ever truly understand the ugly motivation? Well, you're about to hear from a former white nationalist who doesn't hold back about the hatred that festered in his mind. But first, let's meet the Sikh man who became his unlikely friend in the wake of another cold-blooded attack. Nick Purden tells us their story. My father died a heroic death. He died fighting against a racist gunman. He died in the place that he helped build. He might have lost that fight, but we continue on in that battle. 
The shooting still plays out inside Pardeep Singh Kalika's head. August 5th, 2012. A gunman bursts into the temple and starts killing. He murders six people. I've come here to the Sikh temple of Milwaukee to ask those who've been through these kinds of tragedies how they can be stopped. Among the dead that day was Pardeep's father. So where was he? He was down in this room over here, as were, the, as were some other priests and things like that. And so he took his final breaths, and the shooter comes into here, and there's, a, another, there's another man and, and himself, and then another, there's another priest in here. Dad was trying to wrestle him down because he also saw an opportunity when the, when the shooter ran out of bullets as, as the time to like, try to attack. As he's trying to attack, the shooter is able to get um, his magazine reloaded, and uh, that's when Dad suffered the five shots uh, to his side. You know, Dad felt a deep sense of responsibility for his congregation. He also knew my mom was inside the temple at the time. So he wasn't ready. He wasn't going to leave. So this is, this is the bullet hole. And it basically says underneath here, we are one, August 5th, 2012. It is also the first words in our scripture, Ekunkar, which is we are one. That we, are, we have always been one and we will return to being one. After the shooting, Pardeep did everything he thought his father would have done. He made funeral arrangements for people and he tried to make sense of the events of that day. We weren't surprised that a white supremacist would do something like this. I guess it just hurt because of, uh, because people were trying so hard to become part of the American fabric, to be told that you're not American enough, um, hurts. I wanted to know why the shooter did what he did. Why did he come to that temple at that day um, on that morning and, and, and kill the people that he did? Pardeep didn't know it, but there was someone else in Milwaukee at that time who was also desperate to find out more about the killer. Arno Michaelis had recently left the white supremacist movement in Wisconsin. The evening of the shooting, it was announced that the shooter was an affiliated white supremacist. In so many ways, this guy was exactly who I used to be. Did you feel responsible on some level? I did lay awake that night wondering if it was someone that I recruited or you know, someone that, that I knew from back in the day. I had this really sinking feeling from the get-go that like I had something to do with this. For seven years, Arno lived and breathed racism. He was the founder and leader of a worldwide skinhead movement. We must secure the existence of our race and the future of our white children. He sang in a white power band, which is how he got involved in white supremacy at 16. But the lyrics were about race and nation and blood and soil, like all these really seductive themes that Adolf Hitler used to corrupt the minds of so many Germans back in the 30s and 40s. And uh, to me, I, that all that language really like resounded with me. I, I didn't really care about anything up until then. If I had met you back then, what were you like? I, I pretty much like radiated hostility. And if I met uh, a white guy, I would immediately start going into my racist diatribe and try to like recruit them. If people didn't respond well to it, I'd, I'd attack them on the spot. What do you mean? I'd punch them. I'd, I'd hit them. There, there were times... Arno doesn't shy away from admitting what he did. He wants people to know exactly what a white supremacist is capable of. I don't know how many times where we would just... There would be ten of us walking down the street, and if we saw one lone guy and it was just a target of opportunity, we just jump on him and just beat the mess out of him, leave him a bloody pulp. And it, sometimes it was because they were black or sometimes it was, we thought they were gay and we'd just jump on them and brutally beat them, leave them for dead. In those days, did you ever think of going into a place of worship and shooting people? 
I had guns. We, we all, by the end, we all had a ton of guns as we were kind of like prepping for a, an impending race war that we saw. Had I not gotten out, had I continued down that path, I, it, it certainly would be in the realm of possibility that the, the ideology would have made me so miserable that nothing but homicide followed by suicide seemed to make sense. What Arnos has prevented then was the birth of his daughter. As more and more of the racists around him were ending up dead or in jail, he became a father. He got a job. He thought he'd left the world of white supremacy behind. Then the shooting happened at the Sikh temple only a few kilometers away, and it came rushing back. The shooter was a member of the same racist group Arno helped start. So I, I certainly uh, felt a, a real urgent responsibility because of the actual hands-on role that I had in, in bringing that group to life. Yep. At the same time, Pardeep, still dealing with the death of his yeah. father, wanted yeah. answers. And so he contacted Arno. And I just thought that he might know the shooter, that he might be able to like, get into the intricacies of like that, the day or the day before, and things like that, of why he chose that place. Um, and so I was really looking for an explanation, explanations. But I knew it as a part of me that was like, what am I doing? Because part of you also thinks like, once a white supremacist, always a white supremacist. Arno and Pardeep spoke on the phone a few times and then decided to meet. They chose this restaurant in downtown Milwaukee. When I asked Arno why did the shooting happen, he responded quite simply, hurt people, hurt other people. And um, he, you know, he, he was honest to say that he didn't know who the shooter was, but the shooter was very much who he used to be. He was um, kind of suspicious of my turnaround, as was a lot of people in his family. And I can't begrudge anybody that, because I've done horrible things. I, I love the raft theme, uh, just for like an environment. Against all odds, standpoint. Pardeep and Arno formed an unlikely friendship. We talked a lot about our dads, and we talked a lot about our daughters. And we found out as we we're sharing stories of our loved ones, like how similar not only our loved ones were, but how similar we were. Well, thanks for that, too. <laughs> and they committed to working together to stop the racist violence that had brought them together. I knew right then that uh, party was going to be an important part of my life. Yeah, yeah. when we go to uh, Palo Alto, do we got some time available over there? Yeah. So Arno and Pardeep travel the world telling their story of how friendship overcame hate. You know, we could start off by just talking about storytelling and the importance of storytelling. Yeah, yeah. And they meet hundreds of people, students, politicians, and they push them to take action against racism. Uh, how are you doing? But with the rise of white supremacy around the world, sometimes they can't help but feel discouraged. It feels like um, <clears throat> all the work we did is just for nothing. I mean, I know we can't be responsible for what people in Christchurch do, but yeah. it still feels like we failed, kind of. Yeah, yeah. But they're not giving up. All right, man, let's get out of here. <clears throat> in fact, they feel their work is more urgent than ever. All right, homie. All right, brother. I'll see you later tonight. Tonight, they're speaking at a local theater. My purpose was to save all the white people from these evil black, brown, yellow, and red people who want to kill all the white people. So I wasn't just like, ooh, I hate you, but I hate this school, and I hate the police, and I hate the government, and I hate society. It's like, whoa, rah, keep the hate coming. And for seven years, we radiated hate and violence out into the world. We suffered on August 5th. 2012, when a white supremacist gunman walked into the Sikh temple of Wisconsin and murdered six people as they worshiped that day. One of the people that would be taken that day was my father and temple president, Satwan Singh Kalika. For me, personally, that day um, was an awakening. It was this awakening to what are you going to do when something happens to you? And the person that I reached out to was the most unlikeliest of allies. The person that I reached out to was Arno. People oftentimes ask us and ask me, why did you do that? The main reason I did that was to understand why 
people do what they do. And the more important thing, what are we going to do about it? It's been seven years since Pardeep's father died trying to stop a racist gunman here inside their temple. And every day since, he's been working to stop it happening again. Dad, his life was one of connection, and it was one of love. And I, and I look at me and Arnold's journey together as an extension of that love. The lasting um, message from what happened on August 5th is not going to be the shooter's rampage. Nick Purden, CBC News, Milwaukee. What an incredible story. Still ahead on The National, we head to Israel to take the pulse after yesterday's election and ask just what happens next. I mean, it's extraordinary in the sense that he's been re-elected now five times. I think that's the really striking part of it. We're looking at about 26% who voted for him, according to the current tally. That's not a majority. Following the latest escalations between the U.S. and Venezuela, Vice President Mike Pence took aim at Venezuela's envoy to the U.N. today. With all due respect, Mr. Ambassador, you shouldn't be here. You should return to Venezuela and tell Nicolas Maduro that his time is up. Pence also called for a formal recognition of Juan Guaido as the rightful leader of Venezuela, which he called a failed state. He says the U.S. is determined to restore democracy to the country, preferably through diplomatic and economic pressure, but that all options are still on the table. In his first speech to the nation in more than three months, Cuban leader Raul Castro said residents should brace for worsening shortages due to Trump administration policies. It has become increasingly hard for Cubans to find basic goods. The U.S. indicated it's set to announce additional action against Cuba for its support of Venezuela's Nicolas Maduro. And Indian officials are making last-minute preparations for what is set to be the biggest election in the country's history. The first wave of, get this, 900 million eligible voters is set to hit the polls in a matter of hours. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is seen as the front-runner, campaigning on his national security record. But the race has become tighter than anticipated. To the aftermath of Israel's elections now, officially the final tally isn't in yet, but the U.S. president has already congratulated his staunch ally. Bibi Netanyahu, it looks like that race has been won by him. Everybody said you can't have peace in the Middle East with Israel and the Palestinians. I think we have a chance, and I think we have now a better chance with Bibi having won. Okay, so in mentioning peace, Trump seems to suggest big changes are coming. After Benjamin Netanyahu, often known by his nickname Bibi, secures a win. But in terms of leadership, change is not what many Israelis voted for yesterday. Netanyahu is now on track to become the longest-serving prime minister in Israel's history. And as Susan Ormiston tells us, while the election is over, those divisions remain. An incoming tide delivered Benjamin Netanyahu the chance once more to form a government. Delia Suiza couldn't be happier. The security is good and the economic kick is good. And today is my birthday as it's a very good present for me. Thank you, Divi. The wave of change facing Netanyahu was powerful, but not enough. As Tel Aviv absorbed the prospect of his fifth term, Omar Razin wasn't happy. Netanyahu is not the big problem. The big problem is now the older religious people that really have a lot of power, especially when they force their ideology on us. So for us, the re religious people that Netanyahu is taking with him is the big problem. Overnight, political fortunes churned. First, Benny Gantz and the Blue and White Party prematurely boasted they'd won, followed in the wee hours by a Likud victory party. By morning, the parties were tied with 35 seats each, but that is not the only key to governing. 
The path to power here at the Knesset is complicated. With no one party gaining a clear majority of the 120 seats, Israel's president will now ask one of the leading parties to try to form a viable coalition government. And negotiations could take weeks. It's likely the nod will go to Netanyahu. Political analyst Delia Shainlin. I mean, it's extraordinary in the sense that he's been re-elected now five times. I think that's the really striking part of it. We're looking at about 26 percent who voted for him, according to the current tally. That's not a majority. This is not, you know, uh, somebody sweeping the Israeli public. So now what? The prime minister still faces possible indictment on corruption allegations, which he denies. And will he pick up on a dramatic last-minute campaign promise to annex Jewish settlements in the occupied West Bank? Netanyahu, by some accounts, wants to move very fast to nowhere in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So I don't know if he will speed up towards formal annexation, despite his promises. Palestinians expect a new result just reflects the old. Netanyahu. Netanyahu's lead, he says, confirms they don't want peace. The day after, Israelis seem relieved or resigned, not hugely surprised, taking a breath before politics churns up here once more. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Tel Aviv. Coming up on The National, it's hockey playoff time, which is serious business for fans, including some elementary students in Winnipeg. To do well in the playoffs, the Jets should do a couple of things, and these are them. Their advice for the Winnipeg Jets next in our moment. But first, this single image of a 22-year-old woman has become a powerful symbol of resistance in Sudan. <laughs> Alay Sala was leading a chant, effectively calling for revolution at an anti-government demonstration. For months, protesters have been calling for President Omar al-Bashir to get out. He has been in power for 30 years, accused of crimes against humanity and genocide, allowing his country to fall into economic ruin. But no protest, no image has captured the world's attention quite like this one. It's been shared thousands of times online. People are calling Salah a queen, Sudan's Statue of Liberty. On Twitter today, Salah said she wanted to speak against racism and tribalism in all its forms. That every time people responded with revolution, she would get more excited. She said she's been receiving death threats since her picture and video went viral, but she will not bow down. And as for the woman who took this now iconic photo, she explained today she is proud, but won't be happy until things actually change. Try to share our story, tell, tell our story for everyone in the world, and uh, pray for us to be in a better, in a better Sudan. So I am told that it is the first night of the NHL playoffs and there are, I am told, three Canadian teams in the mix. The Calgary Flames, the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Winnipeg Jets who face off tonight against the St. Louis Blues. Last year the Jets made it pretty far but this year fans want to see them go all the way. With that in mind some young fans decided to share tips on how to win the Stanley Cup and their advice is our moment of the day. Dear to do well in the playoffs. To do well in the playoffs. To do well in the playoffs. The Jets should sharpen their blades of their skates so they don't stumble on the ice. Eat healthy food and smoothies and have a good night's sleep. Watch their old games to see what they did wrong and could do better. Smile, don't get penalties, and wear your seat belt. belt. Also practice a ton. Shoot pucks on their goalie. The church should call their mothers. Get an energy drink from the store. And also get some hot Cheetos before the game. Definitely. Go Jets, go! Go Jets, go! Go Jets, go! I I'm, just, I'm just writing that down, especially the uh, energy drinks and the hot Cheetos. Hot Cheetos. Because I think we could all Into use that it. before a big game. Uh, these fine young minds, I hope we're all sleeping now, but they are from uh, Ecole Luxton, the Luxton School in Winnipeg, grades one, two, and three, and they spent a good part of this week working on those letters. So I hope the Jets uh, say, send thank you letters to the kids. 
And as you know, I am from Winnipeg, yes. and I have before been part of a whiteout, even though I'm not the biggest hockey fan now. I used to be. And so I can relate to this whole Go Jets Go thing. And if people are wondering where um, the fair Ian is yes. tonight, it's because he has taken the night off to sit and watch all the hockey That's games right. happening. And I'll I can tell you, you that because it's on Twitter. So, you know, <laughs> it's secrets out there anyway. <laughs> so he's enjoying himself. That's good. And that is the National for April 10th. Good night, everybody. Good night.